Dear colleagues, um, welcome to today's uh, ERA webinar on robotics in medicine. Uh, the title is Where are we in cardiac electrophysiology? Let me to introduce first myself. I'm Dr. Tamás Zirituruk from the Erasmus University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And this webinar is um, possible thanks to the educational grant from Stereotaxis. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of the usefulness and the advantages of using remote magnetic navigation during cardiac ablation procedures. Remote magnetic navigation, as many of you know, was introduced in clinical electrophysiology almost 15 years ago. Until now, more than 100,000 ablations were performed, and um, we, the guest speakers, and the EP community will definitely move to the next 100,000, and probably we will achieve that with a shorter period of time. Today's cases will be presented by two excellent presenters, Dr. Uh, Nolker from Bad Önhuizen and Dr. De Shiu from Nancy. Uh, Dr. Nolker is one of the early adopters of this technology and also he is a board member of the Society of Cardiac uh, Robotic Navigation. While uh, Prof uh, Professor uh, De Shiu is uh, one of the most successful users of this technology, uh, in the last years, and his focus is in ablation of ventricular um, arrhythmias. This session will be highly interactive, and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions, your comments at any time during the webinar throughout the chat function. For the best learning experience, uh, we also invite you to participate in the online assessment sessions that you can submit um, during the presentations uh, or after the presentations. Anything you need to know, just ask and we will provide tips and tricks for the daily clinical practice. Now, after this introduction, I will hand over uh, the microphone to Dr. Nöker and I would like to ask you to present uh, your case. Uh, thanks so much for introducing me. It's a pleasure for me to take part in this ERA webinar on magnetic navigation and I'd like to uh, step right into the case I would like to present. It's the case of a 71-year-old lady suffering from hypertension, diabetes, and she's highly symptomatic. Uh, of atrial fibrillation. Initially, she was suffering from paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Um, AFib goes now for five years, and multiple drugs have been ineffective. Left ventricular function is preserved, and uh, the left atrium is moderately enlarged. She underwent radio iodine therapy for hyperthyreosis, and during that time, um, atrial fibrillation turned over into persistent atrial fibrillation that was three years ago and she's still highly symptomatic. Now what is special about the case, the special thing about this case is that uh, in this patient there's no direct continuity between the inferior vena cava and the right atrium. So the blood from the lower parts of the body is drained via a vena acigus towards the superior vena cafe. This anomaly is pretty rare. Um, it's found 12 times in um, 8,000 patients in this large study. But uh, we are seeing challenging cases from time to time, so it's a nice example of a challenging case. And uh, I got a first multiple choice question for you. And this is what are the therapeutic options of choice in this case? Uh, first is pulmonary vein isolation. Second is pulmonary vein isolation plus additional lesions. Third is anticoagulation. Fourth is lifestyle modification. And uh, of note, more than one may be right. 
yeah, uh, it, it takes about one minute until we get the answer for this poll uh, from the viewers of this webinar. And in the mean, meantime, um, let me to ask you, because we are talking today about robotics, that um, what uh, made you um, uh, using the robotic system? What is the history in your hospital? Um, so I, I went to another hospital 10 years ago, and I found the technology there. And the technology was introduced to me, and my colleague thought I could be the right man for the technology. And I tried it out and was pretty hard in the beginning. And uh, after 20 to 30 cases, I realized that it's uh, pretty elegant to direct the catheter from the tip and uh, became better and better. And I really liked uh, to move cathodes catheters uh, from a remote place without being exposed to radiation and uh, it became my approach of choice in many of uh, the arrhythmias arithmi I'm treating. In the meantime we have the answers and um, I don't know whether you will be surprised but approximately 34 percent of the viewers saying that pulmonary vein isolation and additional lesions and 20% uh, pulmonary vein isolation. So it seems that more than 50% of the viewers thinking that uh, uh, some sort of interventional therapy would be nice for this patient. How would you comment on this? Oh, uh, that's what we did. So that's the next slide. I also went for pulmonary vein isolation and there is a plus and minus for additional lesions we probably can discuss a little bit later on or during my presentation. Uh, anticoagulation for sure is clearly indicated in this patient and lifestyle modification is always a good thing. So just before you continue there, there are two uh, interesting questions um, uh, arrived and uh, the second one I just read because I'm pretty sure that both of you will answer that uh, during your presentation is advantage of robotic technology evidence-based and I think you will provide some slides about this. Um, uh, the second one is a little bit more interesting because I think it's also a good introduction for your uh, present case that how many times the robotic navigation fails to correctly uh, functioning in your experience. So why I'm saying is matching to this um, um, case, because obviously you will show an extremely difficult case. So um, the question is how many times actually it's an inappropriate uh, technology in your hands? So I'd like to take the second question. Uh, in the beginning when we used the magnetic system, um, sometimes we did not make it and um, crossed over to manual. And the experience was that we never made it manually when we could not make it magnetically. That means that we nowadays do not even try to move over to the manual approach when magnetic does not work. Um, not every case is a solution and not every ablation is successful, but uh, what you can do with the manual can always be done with the magnetic and uh, things that can't be done with the manual can often be done with the magnetic system. Thank you. Just go ahead. So we were talking already about the magnetic system and that's the system we chose for this uh, special case. I'd like to introduce it in a few slides. So the magnetic system consists of two permanent magnets, one at each side of the patients, and uh, the magnets create a magnetic field, and that can be changed by moving the magnets. And in the middle of the magnetic field, a magnetic catheter is placed, uh, embedded with three further magnets. And by um, changing the magnetic field from a remote controller, uh, you can move this magnetic catheter. Now back to our case, you see that we already advanced the catheter here via the acicus vein uh, to uh, the superior part of the right atrium. It's a 
intracardiac echo catheter in use uh, in all our left atrial procedures. And this nicely shows you where the continuity is of the acetabulum vein in this patient. But uh, this is an approach which is uh, definitely not possible for transeptal punctures. So uh, we went retrogradely through the aorta. You see that the long sheath is placed uh, into the ascending part of the aorta, and you see how the catheter is. Uh, is crossing the uh, aortic valve here and reaching the left ventricle. Now in the left ventricle we uh, created a 3D shell and uh, what's most important of this 3D shell of the left ventricle is uh, that you see the adaption of the mitral valve leaflets here. And that's the part you get across to get into the left atrium. And uh, we made that by magnetic navigation. And you see uh, that we could reach all parts of the left atrium here with a magnetic catheter when we were in. This led to a creation of a 3D shell of the left atrium. And here already. Uh, the uh, ablation points can be seen, so you see our ablation approach. It's a wide antral circumferential ablation approach with um, ablating the ipsilateral veins with one circle, as you can see here. That's the procedural data. Procedural dur duration pretty long, 340 mm -hmm. minutes. Uh, fluoro exposure time 42 minutes uh, also pretty long but probably um, very well explained by the complexity of the procedure we did ablation time 74 minutes and this is important no complications uh, that's typical for magnetic procedures that you don't see complications. The complication rates, in particular, the complication rates uh, in terms of uh, major adverse events are really very, very low. Now, let's look at the outcome. Um, the patient experienced an early recurrence two days after the procedure, underwent cardioversion under uh, amiodarone, um, afterwards multiple cardioversions during the blanking period, and also after the ending of the blanking period. Uh, we suggested to go for a second procedure, but uh, the patient was unwilling to undergo a second invasive procedure. Now I got my second multiple choice question for you. It's uh, the question for possible reasons for the recurrence in this patient. So uh, first would be ineffectiveness of magnetic catheters due to suboptimal tissue contact. Second would be ineffectiveness of PVI only and persistent atrial fibrillation. Third is missing circumferential mapping catheter. And last is lower single procedural success rates in persistent atrial fibrillation compared to paroxysmal. And again, more than one may be right. Still a few seconds left until the poll is completed. Um, there was uh, one question in the meantime. Um, let's assume that the patient agrees uh, with the redo. She didn't, but uh, um, what would have been your, um, according to the question, your strategy uh, during the redo procedure? So as long as the pulmonary veins are not isolated, I, I'd go for a PVI again. In this fashion, we, we chose in the first uh, um, attempt, so wide antral isolation. In case the pulmonary veins were isolated, we are in an open field, so we got no data on what to do then. Um, a rotor ablation may be an option, but not in this case, as we cannot place a basket catheter. So um, substrate-based ablation may be a, a second option. 
I would not go for lines uh, in cases of uh, atrial fibrillation and reserve this for left atrial tachycardias. Um, I have the results. Let's be a bit nasty. What do you think, uh, which was the most popular answer from your options? Um, I don't, I can't look in, in, um, in, um, in other people's heads and uh, in particular when, I, when, when they are that far away as today, but uh, probably uh, uh, it might be the second one. So I, I think um, uh, the good news for the robotic users, because I think there is sometimes a mi misconception about lesion formation, that only minority of the people uh, were voting for that, and uh, um, almost 40 percent, and that was the um, most frequent answer, said that the lower single procedure success rates in persistent atrial fibrillation, which is, I think, a very realistic and a good answer in 2018. Now, are there any further questions? Not at the moment. So let's probably look at my thoughts. Um, again, this the technology and uh, the catheter, as you can see here, is, uh, uh, is very floppy, so like an, an al dente spaghetti in a way. And you see the three magnets a little bit better than in the video I showed you before. This is a gold tip catheter, an irrigated gold uh, tip catheter, which ran out and uh, will be replaced by a novel one, which is already developed and presented. And uh, what's the special thing about these floppy catheters? On the left side, you see a conventional catheter, a stiff catheter manually directed. And on the right side, you see a magnetic catheter, and uh, you see the difference? The difference is that the magnetic catheter is following the tissue. The patient is uh, breathing, perhaps not in that video, but the, the heart is moving, and the catheter always follows due to the constant force of the magnetic field. So the type of contact answering the first question is better because it's constant. Is constant really better? Yeah, we know constant is better. This has been shown by Deepen Shah and colleagues several years ago. Constant contact in comparison to variable or intermittent contact creates the better lesions. Is the magnetic system ineffective in ablation of atrial fibrillation? It is not. This is a meter analysis. And uh, let's look here at the atrial fibrillation uh, section. It's equally effective compared to manually directed ablation in atrial fibrillation. And what is not shown in this slide is that complication rates are much lower in uh, magnetically guided ablation procedures of atrial fibrillation. Uh, second was PVI only is uh, ineffective in persistent atrial fibrillation. The opposite is the truth. Again, a meter analyzes almost 20,000 patients, and you see PVI here and antrum PVI here first, or multiple procedures, and you see that the most effective approach in the first procedure in this large meter analysis is pulmonary vein antrum isolation. So it's not true that PVI only is ineffective in persistent atrial fibrillation. What's about the role of the circumferential mapping catheter? Uh, this uh, m may have been of importance because uh, Tamborero and colleagues nicely showed several years ago that uh, atrial fibrillation uh, ablation procedures are more successful when a circumferential mapping catheter is in use. So my answers would have been ineffectiveness of uh, magnetic catheters due to suboptimal 
tissue contact is clearly not true. Ineffectiveness of PVI only and persistent atrial fibrillation also not true. Missing circumferential mapping catheter might have played a role, but uh, the lower single procedural success rates and persistent atrial fibrillation uh, are clearly true, so I agree with the audience. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, in the meantime, we received a few uh, remarks. Actually, one of them is more a comment. It's quite a short and a powerful, uh, stating that one procedure is not enough uh, for persistent atrial fibrillation. And the other is more a question to you. Um, uh, how much the rate of success can increase in a repeated procedure respect to the single one? according to the data you presented. So I, I disagree to the statement, because uh, in 50% of the patients, a uh, single procedure has a, uh, has a good 12-month uh, success in curing atrial fibrillation. So it might be successful, but uh, clear. Uh, multiple procedures are more often needed in persistent atrial fibrillation compared to paroxysmal. That's clear. And the uh, second one was on, help me a little bit. Um, what is the percentage increase if you add uh, additional procedures? What can you achieve after the first procedure if you add the additional procedures? So probably if we go back a little bit to the slide. Um, you see that in the first procedure, um, you get between 50 and 60 percent with a PVI only strategy, and in multiple procedures, you reach 70 to 80, depending on the strategy. Um, keep in mind, this is not a prospectively randomized trial, it's just a summary of published data. Thank you. And I think we also can look at from the optimistic and the pessimistic point of view, because you mentioned 50 percent. Um, looking at the complexity of the disease, probably it sounds attractive, but on the other hand, uh, when you treat patients and when you look at the meaning of um, uh, health care and providing care to people, um, preparing for multiple procedures is probably not the optimal case scenario. And I think we all have to work on solutions which end up finally in, in, a, in a high single procedural success. But I completely agree with you that in this particular case, in persistent atrial fibrillation, we are very far from this. Probably short remark. Uh, we always look at success rates in terms of never again atrial fibrillation. But we recently learned that reducing the burden of atrial fibrillation may also be an effective treatment uh, from the sub-analysis of CASL AF. So keep in mind, success can also be a reduction of burden. Absolutely, I cannot agree more. So then we move forward to the VT, and I will ask uh, Christian uh, to talk about the, his experience through a case or cases in the VT ablation. What's the best approach? So thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for my uh, talk in this uh, Robotics in Electrophysiology webinar, uh, I will focus on uh, VT ablation. And as an introduction, I would like to say that uh, the two parts of the procedure is the use of a 3D mapping system. And of course, you need an ablation catheter and sometimes an extra mapping, a multiple uh, catheter. But of course, you have to think after you get uh, the uh, um, analysis of your data during the procedure to understand where, uh, what is the mechanism of the arrhythmia and what is the ablation target in those patients. But going back to the ablation catheter, there are some important characteristics. And I think that the ideal ablation catheter should be efficient and be able to reach easily and quickly any cardiac location, it should be safe and special atraumatic, and it should be efficient. What I mean by that is it should be able to create appropriate RF lesions. So in the first parts of my talk, I would like to show you this uh, 
movie that I think many of you know. Uh, and as you can see here, you don't see the magnets, but this is a uh, um, remote magnetic navigation catheter where you see that the catheter is moving through these different holes here. There's, there's a snake is creeping here. And uh, it seems, of course, that uh, moving catheter with such a freedom of movement is very important and interesting uh, for a VT ablation. Now I would like to start right away with uh, the first question. Uh, and uh, the question is, which of the following propositions about uh, remote magnetic navigation is true? So there is just one answer which is true. And you have five propositions. The first one is, the softness of the catheter, because of a low pushability, is a limitation to map some areas, especially the CS and the right ventricular free wall. Second, virtual anatomy volumes are underestimated as compared to real anatomy volumes because of a poor catheter contact. And third proposition is catheter navigation is time consuming because of the inertia related to the movement of the ma magnets, which uh, weighs uh, 400 kilograms each. So either one of these propositions is true, or you may have D as all propositions are true, or E, all propositions are wrong. Christian, you, you raise here very um, interesting concerns about uh, this technology. and. Um, in which I don't know in which year you exactly um, started with the stereotaxis, but relatively late as compared to some other centers. And um, until we get the questions, uh, would you comment? On, were you actually concerned about this before you purchased the system, or you were completely confident that that it's gonna be okay? No, I was confident that it would be okay, just because uh, I went in different centers just to see uh, online procedures and to make my mind about the quality of the system. So when we decided to buy the system three years ago, uh, we were convinced that uh, it would be efficient. So then it's um, extremely interesting to see what the result is uh, of um, the answers for this question because truly the majority of the viewers are saying that all are wrong and probably that's what you expected too. But still approximately 30% are saying that all are actually true. So it's t it seems that the EP community is very divided about this very in important issue. Um, what do you think, what do we need as EP community actually to, um, to convince people or actually to get more in, um, into a unified uh, opinion? What should we do? Well, I think that the best to be convinced is to go in a lab and to attend a procedure. That's the best way to be convinced. Because looking at the literature and looking at what you can read about that, uh, maybe not convincing just because the opinions may vary. But if you see with your own eyes that the procedure is really successful, then you change your mind if you were reluctant to think so. I, I agree, and but on the other hand, then you have to choose the right spot to go, actually. <laughs> okay, thank you. No other questions at this moment. So with this example, so I will, the right answer was D. Or are wrong. So I'm going to try to convince the 30% of the people of thoughts that it was uh, not right. And with this example here, you see an MRI reconstruction of the left ventricle in a patient with a myocardial infarction. So this is the scar area, and in pale green is the healthy area. And you see here the infarct, which was an inferior infarct in this patient. He had VT and he went in the lab. And we were moving uh, the catheter in, in the left ventricle. And as you can see here, it was impossible to reach this area, despite we tried many, many times with a conventional uh, ablation catheter. And uh, it may be a very challenging area. Now, <clears throat> when we are using uh, the uh, stereotaxis system, and this is a case of a patient where you can see that we got a complete 3D reconstruction 
of all the heart. And we started in the right ventricle because it was a lady with a right ventricular outflow to tachycardia. So these were the pace mapping points and we burned uh, one in, at one of these uh, sites. So uh, we started with the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery and the uh, right atrium. And after we got uh, um, a grid of the VT, uh, we went into the waiting phase just to be sure that the result would be uh, consistent after 30 minutes. And meantime, just because this lady had the pattern for Ameno Valley, we went in the left atrium, and you can see here a full reconstruction of the left atrium, then in the left ventricle, and went back in the aorta. Uh, and even we reversed the catheter in the aorta to map the aortic cusp. And of course, as you can see, when we went in the right atrium, we could advance the catheter in the CS uh, in this lady without any difficulty. So this is to convince you that manipulating the catheter and reaching many areas is rather simple with such a system. And this is a video, and the length of the video is something like 80 seconds. And we have the CT scan, the right atrium, the right ventricle. It's a patient with an arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And you saw how fast we went from the right atrium into the right ventricle, advanced the catheter just under the right ventricular outflow tract with this magnet vector here. So we are changing the magnet uh, vector pulling the catheter, advancing the catheter in the right ventricular outflow tract without any difficulties and taking points here just under the right ventricular outflow tract and even here above. <coughs> so we are pulling the catheter back now, changing the vector, and we are going to reach here the basal area. So we change the vector, go back in the right ventricle, and we will reverse the magnet uh, force just to go back towards the uh, aortic annulus, and you saw it very uh, uh, in, in the screen that we got already a 3D reconstruction of the right ventricle, but look at that, we reverse the vector and we go back to uh, the lateral parts of the right ventricle very easily, and then we mapped all this area without any difficulty. So again, it's very easy to reach uh, all locations in the heart, and in these patients, we had a 3D reconstruction of a VT circuit. This is the endocardial map here with the figure of atrial trans circuit. And mapping epicardially is easy as well with the remote ma magnetic navigation system. And you see here the epicardial map in, in this same patient here with the same uh, color coding 3D reconstruction of the VT circuit, which has the same uh, geometry here. So I think you were convinced on the first part, and I have a second question now. Again, which of the following propositions is true about uh, uh, magnetic navigation catheter? So there's just one good answer. First proposal is the softness of the catheter has a negative impact on the catheter stability during RF fibrillation. Second is the volume of RF lesion is smaller as compared to conventional catheter due to a low contact force. RF energy should be applied for at least two minutes to obtain an efficient RF lesion in the ventricles, just because, again, of the low contact force. So either one of the three questions is right, or all three are true, or all three are wrong. Yes, here you raised a very important issue of the efficiency of the lesion delivery. Until we see the answers, um, I still would um, go one step back to the navigation capabilities of this system. You showed very elegantly in, in your uh, case that uh, certain parts you couldn't um, reach, and uh, I was very happy to hear that because unfortunately there are unpublished data. It was never published, but you hear from the very early users from this system that at the time when they didn't have thermocool catheter, they used the uh, magnetic navigation for mapping. And then they tried to uh, do the ablation with a manual thermocool catheter. And what you showed actually was a daily practice. They just, uh, many times they couldn't reach the substrate with the manual uh, catheters. And we are talking about extremely experienced, uh, good VT ablators. We have the answer and um, Again, um, a divided community. 
So all three propositions are wrong. That's uh, the majority, 65%. You could convince 5% more, because now it's only 25% who says uh, that um, all three propositions are true. Um, good job, so let's go ahead. And, of course, uh, the, the right proposition is E. Um, I'm going to try to convince the people who did not think that it was the right proposal. Uh, going back to the uh, tissue force contact, of course, because of the, this is a floppy catheter when you use a magnetic catheter and of course the contact is less when you push the catheter or to be more precise because when you are using magnets you are pulling the catheter, you are taking the tip of the catheter. But the contact is less just because it's a floppy catheter. And as you can see the tissue distance, distension here is less as compared to when you use a conventional catheter. But there are some centers who are not convinced about the stability of the catheter and they designed a model here, so it's a nice experiment. And in this center they thought that when you were uh, having this catheter in a, in a given position, it would be very unstable just because of the heart's movement. And this box here is supposed to be the heart and you have a catheter here with an upper approach and it's positioned here with some jelly here. Uh, that you can see with the color changing, and I will go back to that uh, later. But when they are shaking this box, which is supposed to reproduce the heart's uh, movement, as you can see with the conventional catheter, there is some sliding here of the catheter, and you see it very nicely. But when you are using this uh, magnetic catheter, it does not move at all. It seems to be stuck here on this, uh, on this uh, place. And at the same time, as you can see, the volume that you get about the lesion, you get it faster and it's bigger as compared to what you get with this catheter because of the sliding electrode. And in the publication that they did after, they showed very nicely the sliding movement of the conventional catheter as compared to this catheter who is moving here on the, on the shaft of the catheter, but not the extremity which is stuck. And as a consequence, when you look at the lesions on the right-hand side here with either an inferior approach or superior approach in, in, in the box, which is supposed to be the heart, you see that the lesion which is obtained using the magnetic navigation catheter is bigger and deeper, as you can see here, as compared to the manual ablation catheter. So there's no concern about the production of lesion. And this is an example where you can look at the electrograms in a patient in whom we did, we did an AFib ablation, so we have a lesser catheter with the PVPs here. But importantly, look at the signal. We start to ablate here. This is where we start to apply energy. And look at the electrograms, the last electrograms before we started to apply energy. And after two seconds, you have a huge change in the morphology of the electrograms, which indicates that already after two seconds, you obtain already some lesion uh, at the site where you are ablating. And I have a clinical case to convince the more reluctant people who are uh, listening to us. And the case is a 79-year-old man who was referred for catheter ablation of insistent repetitive monomorphic non-sustained VT in a re recently discovered impaired left ventricular function. He had a permanent AFib and he had a pacemaker implanted for symptomatic bradycardia six years ago. He is on VKA and he has a stable uh, INR for at least three months. So in this patient, this is the uh, ECG that we had all during the procedure and this was recorded seven minutes before we started to burn and you will see the, uh, the rest of the case after. But as you can see, you have a spike with the ventricular stimulation here. So this is the pacemaker and again here the pacemaker. And in between, you have this uh, round of non-sustained VT, and again, a round of non-sustained VT. And we had that uh, going on during all the procedure. <clears throat> so we decided, because we had a lot of uh, non-sustained VT, to perform an activation map 
in the left ventricle because of course it was coming from the left ventricle and this is a reconstruction of the left ventricle with the carto system using the stereotaxis with a transeptal approach and we through the transeptal went from the left atrium which is here in the left ventricle so you have the CT scan of this patient with the aorta, the right coronary artery, the left main, the LED and the circumflex here. And on the endocardial surface, you can see the, here that's the activation map. You have a big red area here uh, and the uh, ventricular premature beats are coming from this area. But it was not early enough and we decided to map epicardially, but what I mean by epicardially, it was in the CS. And again, it was very easy to enter in the CS and we could go very deep in the CS in this patient. And this is the area where we had the earliest activation time. In this overview here, you have the um, CS with a very um, large branch here and the ablation catheter is here. And at the site where we had the earliest activation time, we also had the best pace map site here with a 92% of correlation between the pacing uh, uh, ECG and the uh, ventricular premature beat. And the last view here, can you see the catheter in the CS here, close to the appendage here, close to uh, uh, this uh, diagonal branch here, with the thickness of the left ventricular wall, which was uh, tw uh, 12 uh, millimeter. So we decided to burn at this place because it was the earliest uh, activation site. And uh, this is what we did. So this is the first burn. So just before burning, we were advancing and trying to find a good position in the CS. So we changed the magnetic vector. This uh, generates artifact on the surface ECG, as you can see with this movement here. So you have an artifact on the surface ECG. Then we started to, to burn at that site here. So this is the beginning of the RF application and after three seconds we have no BPBs any longer. And this is what we got on the surface ECG 14 minutes after RF ablation. We did this case in February last year and till now the patients had no recurrence of uh, this uh, non-sustained VT and the ejection fraction uh, increased a little bit to 50%. So after this case, I think the great majority has been convinced about the use of uh, uh, magnetic navigation in patients with VT. But I have some another question about um, uh, this uh, uh, magnetic navigation, and this is about uh, the published data on VT ablation. And you have here uh, five propositions. First one is the incidence of major complications is similar using magnetic navigation to that observed with conventional catheter. Second proposition, minutes of radiation exposure is greater with magnetic navigation as compared to manual navigation. Third, several observational studies have been shown a higher acute and long-term success rates using magnetic navigation as compared to manual navigation. So either all propositions are true, all propositions are wrong, or one of the three is wrong. So A, B, C, D, E. Yes, we are waiting for the answer. Um, there is an interesting uh, question from uh, the viewers um, of this uh, webinar. Um, you made it clear that you use a uh, transeptal approach, but um, still there was a question that how do you avoid that um, there will be a knot on the uh, a knot on the catheter from very extensive uh, navigation in different approach? And the, the question was ex actually specifically related to the retrograde ap approach, but you you don't do it. No, we, we never do a retrograde approach except when we have a prosthetic uh, mechanical valve uh, on the mitral annulus. Um, well, we have a huge experience using uh, this transeptal uh, approach, and we did that already when we were using manual navigation. Uh, I think it's safer in terms of complications on the in the groin and uh, arterial complications. Uh, it's a limitation when you are using a, 
uh, manual navigation or uh, a retrograde approach because you are having the catheter for a long time in place, you need to anticoagulate the patients. So that's the reason why we moved to a transeptal approach. And using this approach, we had never difficulties in reaching the different areas in the left ventricle in, in these patients. George, any comments? Uh... No, uh, we had knots. We had knots in the left atrium, but uh, knots are not really a problem. So you can uh, open them up by pushing the catheter and directing the tip in the right direction, and uh, yeah, there are no issue. You you get get a little bit afraid in that moment, uh, but you can stay calm and uh, and have the solution. Yes, exactly. That's our experience as well. It's extremely rare. It can happen, but it's very easy to get rid of it. So in the meantime, I have the answers. And um, uh, the winner at this moment is all three propositions are wrong. But I must say that the C, D and uh, E is almost equal in terms of percentages. Mm -hmm. So it's rather well balanced, and the right position, in fact, is C. And before we go uh, further, there is an um, um, other question. It may relate to the discussion what we have. So what is your advice? Um, uh, it's probably from a beginner of a fellow that which is the most suitable procedure uh, for beginners with the uh, remote magnetic navigation to start with? I think it's a very good question. Well, I, I think that it's rather easy to do right ventricular outflow track VPB ablation using the system or accessory pathways uh, along the tricuspid annulus. So that I would start with that because it's a rather simple electrophysiological procedure, I would say. And uh, learning how to move the catheter and to reach the reason, it's certainly very uh, a very good starting point. I'd agree. Right ventricular outflow tract is also great because you don't have mechanical uh, ectopic beats, so that's also probably disturbing for beginners of magnetic navigation. Not say same thing. I also agree and I have one uh, more additional comment about the accessory pathways um, because we do a lot of retrograde uh, uh, approach. Um, on the other hand one of the most difficult thing um, in the whole magnetic navigation is to ablate and left um, lateral accessory pathway with a retrograde approach in some cases. Um, but because the electrophysiology behind is so clear, I think it's also a very good uh, uh, way to learn uh, navigation. I always say if you can do that, you can easily start with the pulmonary vein isolation because it will be much uh, easier. Short questions because before you finish your presentation, what is the cost of the system? That's uh, <laughs> one of the questions which has arrived. <laughs> Well, the, the cost is, it depends of uh, the different uh, facilities uh, you will have in the lab, but it's around 2 and 2.5, uh, uh, um, how do say, million euros. And, uh, but depending on the facilities you will choose, uh, that's the range that you will have. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to the different points, and we have some data from the literature. Um, I could look at the different uh, data that we that we have published individually, but this is um, pool data which have been published here in the literature in this uh, Dutch uh, journal uh, three years ago. So. Um, uh, Dr. Wu reviewed the different cases, and as you can see here, in terms of major complications, with the manual navigation here in gray, you see that the manual navigation has a higher complication rate as compared to a magnetic navigation, which is here 0.3, here it's 0, here it's 0, and here it's 1.2. So uh, there are data consistent with the fact that the complication rate is not superior uh, using the uh, magnetic navigation as compared to manual navigation, and it's even less. It's not randomized, but in these uh, observational studies, uh, it's uh, less. In terms of uh, radiation exposure, it's the same. Gained from VT cases, so it's the same publication, and the same results, as you can see here, 
in gray, you have a higher uh, minutes of uh, radiation exposure with the manual navigation as compared to MRI uh, remote magnetic navigation, which is here in dark blue. And finally, in terms of results, you have here two panels on the left hand side. These are again the pooled data uh, published in this study here with the different uh, publications uh, here. And the excuse, acute success rate, as you can see here, it was always higher in the right uh, column here as compared to the left column. And the right column is the magnetic navigation. This is the only case where, and it was almost 100% success rate, where it was equal, but in the other cases it was higher. And at one year, it's the same. The uh, uh, right bar here is always superior to the left bar, which indicates that uh, we have some data consistent with the fact that uh, long-term success rate is higher using uh, magnetic navigation as compared to manual navigation. Now, as a conclusion, I would say that first point, catheter navigation using a magnetic navigation system is a very useful tool for VT ablation. And in our experience, it's especially true for post-infarct VT and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. There are data from the literature which suggest that both acute and one-year success rate of VT ablation using the stereotaxis system is at least non-inferior to manual catheter navigation, but these are observational studies and of course a randomized trial is necessary and there is one randomized trial which is ongoing and the name is Magnetic VT, so there are some um, around 100 cases which have been included so far, a little bit more even, and what I think is that the investment cost to acquire the uh, magnetic navigation system is justified by its capabilities that I showed during this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, this excellent um, overview. And uh, actually, with your last point, you also answered a little bit the uh, question what I asked um, uh, just a few minutes ago. We still have a few minutes left from this webinar, and um, I would like to draw the attention to the title of this webinar, that Robotics in Medicine, uh, Where Are We in Electrophysiology? And um, truly, we are talking at this moment about remote uh, navigation. The question is how our guest speakers see the future. What do you think? When uh, does it become truly robotics? Will it be ever robotics in medicine? Is there a need for robotics? Well, I, I think that we are already in the area of uh, robotics in many fields in medicine. But in terms of electrophysiology, I think that um, we need to convince people and people should go in labs just to see that these systems are actually very effective. That's the first point, convincing people. Now, in terms of um, technology, the system is getting better and better. I saw it five years ago before I bought it, and I saw it 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I was not really convinced, but the improvement was so huge between 10 years and five years ago that I decided to buy it. So I think that's from a technological standpoint. Uh, improvement is very huge at the present times in terms of technology. So I think that in the future, it's it will be even more important in terms of the capabilities of the system, especially to not measure the contact so far, but to have some uh, possibilities to have ideas on the contact of the catheter, on, on the real anatomy that we get as compared to the cartel system. So I think things things are really improving right now. And George, um, any remarks maybe about the automatic features? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point, So, What we don't have in manually directed procedures is automation. And uh, for sure, automation is not always good, but can be very helpful. So the uh, robotic systems got the capability of automation, and uh, thereby um, they got the opportunity to help in particular fellows or younger operators uh, directing them through the procedures. Um, I think in 20, 30 years we see a lot of robotically 
directed procedures in medicine. I also think so. And when you look at what happens uh, all around the uh, world in different um, fields, like uh, the car business, uh, the self-driving uh, cars, I think it cannot be stopped. And I would be extremely surprised if we see uh, people moving catheters with their hands um, uh, in about 50 years. But unfortunately, I will probably not see that. Um, on the other hand, it's still medicine. And I think uh, one of the reasons why the uh, rate is limited that in medicine we cannot afford accidents because you hear here about the robotic accidents and we just cannot afford when we treat uh, human beings any other uh, issues you want to raise one of the thing uh, there is one question question just arrived lately it's about the related to the power settings because both of you made it clear that the catheter stability is very important issue. Just uh, we have time for a short remarks about the power setting. Should it be the standard or should it be different uh, with uh, using this system? I think that um, as, as I show in the model that has been published, stability is very good with this kind of catheter. Uh, but of course, the contact force is less as compared to uh, another catheter where you don't have this floppy uh, problem. Um, but I think that uh, the most important part to create a good lesion is to have stability. It's not necessary to have a huge contact, uh, but to uh, overcome this uh, problem of contact and to get a greater lesion in terms of volume, it's necessary to increase the power. And each time we are increasing the power in the left atrium, in the left ventricle, and in the left atrium we go up to 35 very uh, rapidly in all these patients and in the ventricle to 45 uh, very uh, very often as well. George? Um, I fully agree. Our power settings are a little bit higher, 40 in, uh, in the atria and 50 in the ventricles. But uh, after all, it's not dangerous. It's um, effective. And um, that's a side effect of the stability and of the limited contact force that we can go for higher outputs. Yeah, I also agree. And uh, one of the the issue, what is also important, that I'm much more comfortable of uh, increasing the power because I know that it it's never associated with ec extreme force. So I just feel um, e easy to increase it. Um, I think uh, I must say thanks to you uh, for the two excellent presentations. We are approaching the end of this webinar and I would like to close this session by uh, reminding some key messages for the daily practice. One of the most important thing is that remote magnetic navigation provides an excellent catheter tip delivery to the targeted tissue, even in the most difficult clinical and anatomical situation. Uh, it is a misconception, and I think you all are convinced, that the magnetic navigation cannot deliver appropriate radio frequency energy. Contrary, it has good capabilities to deliver therapy. And this is indicated by the excellent results uh, presented by George and Christian. We will now close this webinar. Thank you uh, to both of you for the interesting presentation. And again, thanks to Stereotaxis who supported this webinar. And we hope you enjoyed this time with us. And uh, one more important thing, you will be able to view again this webinar offline in a few days on the, of the website of the European Society of Cardiology. Thank you.